Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Boudreau. I'm Manamit's Donor Relations Manager, and I want to thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation, The Invasive European Green Crab. I'm joined today by Dr. Marissa McMahon, the Director of Manamit's Fisheries Division. Uh, Marissa, thank you for being with us. Uh, Marissa is a native Mainer, and she grew up working on her father's lobster boat, which is what led her to marine science. She received her PhD in Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology from Northeastern University, uh, and she has spent the last decade studying marine ecology and fisheries in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, now, before I turn things over to Marissa, I just want to highlight a few things. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, uh, just use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. Now, at any point during today's presentation, you have a question, just click on that Q&A box and type it in so that we can get you an answer at the end of Marissa's presentation. Uh, and if you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's webinar, it will be recorded and we'll share a link uh, to, with you in a follow-up email so that you can watch it on demand uh, or share it with others. Uh, finally, if you are new to Manamit, I just want to tell you a little bit about who we are. We are a science-driven sustainability nonprofit organization. Uh, as a nonprofit, we work to save birds and create a thriving future for them and us. Uh, but to do that, we need to get more people to participate. So together with shrimp farmers in Central America, uh, fishermen in Maine, uh, grocery store employees in California, and so many others, we're working to sustain our world. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn it over to Marissa. All right, thank you, Chris, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm excited to have this opportunity to share this presentation uh, virtually. I typically would be giving this presentation and doing a lot of this work in classrooms with students. Um, but obviously that is not happening at the moment. So um, we've been able to pivot and, and create more of a virtual experience. Um, so this work in general um, that we, we do with green crab education and with classrooms along um, Maine's coast is really aimed at giving an overview of the changes that are happening in the Gulf of Maine um, due to climate change, and also really just focus on what that means for one single species in this case. Um, and then also this presentation and, and the work in the classrooms is also a way to introduce students to some scientific methods, um, ways to collect data on species and, and conduct surveys. So uh, I'm gonna jump right in. And what I wanna do first is just orient everyone to where the Gulf of Maine is. So this is a map. You can see Maine and New Hampshire, Massachusetts, um, and then New Brunswick and Nova Scotia up here in Canada. This red box uh, is where uh, a lot of the, the research that we do on green crabs takes place, but also where a lot of the schools that I would typically be giving this presentation in are located. So parts of mid coast and southern Maine. So the Gulf of Maine spans all the way from up here in the Bay of Fundy all the way down to Cape Cod. So it's this whole body of water. Uh, and in the title, I did mention that we're focused on the changes that are happening in the Gulf of Maine. So, so what are those changes? Well, by and large, the biggest change that we're experiencing right now is warming water. So the Gulf of Maine is actually warming faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans. So why is that happening? Well, it really primarily has to do with ocean currents. So this is a different map of the Gulf of Maine. So we still have our red box up here, which is where uh, a lot of the research we do takes place where a lot of those schools are. Um, but this is looking at the depth contour of the Gulf of Maine. So all of these sort of lighter blue areas are shallow areas and then the darker blue areas are deeper. So you can see there's sort of this long um, light blue arm that kind of extends out from Cape Cod and that's called George's Bank. And that sort of encircles the Gulf of Maine, almost really enclosing it. And then you see there's this deep blue channel right here at the tip of George's Bank. That's called the Northeast Channel. Now, historically, 
very cold water from the Arctic brought down by the Labrador current entered into the Gulf of Maine through this channel. Now we also have another current called the Gulf Stream and that brings warm water up from the tropics. But usually, or at least historically, this warm water and this Gulf Stream didn't make it as far north as the Gulf of Maine. So really we were most influenced by this really cold Labrador current. But what we've seen as uh, ice has continued to melt in the Arctic and more and more fresh water has entered into the ocean is that that Labrador current has been interrupted. So we're seeing less and less of that cold water making it into the Gulf of Maine each year and at the same time the Gulf Stream is moving north. So we're seeing more warm water. So that com combination of less cold water and more warm water happening at the same time is why we see that really rapid rate of warming. And that's having really profound impacts on the ecosystem and the species that live in that ecosystem. So for instance, cold water loving species like northern shrimp really aren't doing very well in this warming environment. Uh, they really depend on those cold Gulf of Maine waters to survive and thrive. And so we're seeing that each and every year there's less and less of them, which is of course bad for our ecosystem to be losing this important species, but also it's bad for our fishermen who actually really depended on this species to help them make a living. Um, some other important species that are um, being impacted by this warming water are cod and lobster. So we're seeing that cod are moving into deeper waters to escape that warming and lobsters are moving further north each and every year. And we're not just seeing impacts to our cold water loving native species, we're also seeing some new species that are entering into the Gulf of Maine. So these are some species on the bottom there that really did not used to live in the Gulf of Maine because it was just too cold for them. So these are more southern species. Um, but now we're seeing things like squid and blue crab, triggerfish and black sea bass all being able to move up into the Gulf of Maine because it's warming. So we're seeing a change to really the fundamental structure of the ecosystem and the species that live there. So um, why we're all here, of course, um, we're also seeing that some species that have lived in the Gulf of Maine for quite some time are actually thriving and really, really doing very well in this warming water. So the, unfortunately, the invasive green crab is one of those species. Green crabs have been in the Gulf of Maine for over 100 years, um, but what we're seeing now is that as the water is warming, they're becoming more and more abundant. They really like this warm water. So I want to do a little bit of background on green crabs um, and, and just sort of introduce how they got here in the first place. So this is a map showing the range of the European green crab. So the blue areas on the map are the native range. This is where green crabs are naturally occurring. And so this is Europe and parts of North Africa, um, Iceland. Uh, these are all of the areas where green crabs are native. All of the green areas on the map are places where green crabs have invaded. And then the red areas are places where they potentially could. And I should point out that this map is a little outdated now. It was made in 2003. So if we were to look at this map today, we'd actually see that many of these red areas are now actually green. Um, and the way that this particular species, the green crab, and many other marine invasive species have actually managed to get from one place to another is in ship ballast water. So essentially ships will pump water into the bottom of the boat or the hull of the boat in order to stabilize it for long ocean journeys. And when they get to where they're going, they pump that water back out. So whatever is in that water is now in this new environment. And that is in fact how green crabs made it from Europe to the east coast of the United States in 1817. So at this point in time, they have actually invaded every continent except Antarctica, and they are considered one of the most successful invasive species in the world. So I want to talk a little bit about why they are so successful at being invasive, 
There's a lot of reasons, but I'm gonna point out some of the most important ones here. One of those reasons is that female green crabs can have up to 165,000 eggs at a time. So they can reproduce a lot of little baby green crabs. This is a picture of a female green crab and that orange sort of mass is hundreds of thousands of little orange eggs. Now, when those eggs hatch, they hatch into what we call larvae. And so this is a picture of green crab larvae. They're very, very tiny. So this picture was actually taken with a very high powered microscope because they're so small that you can't see them without a microscope. So these larvae float around in the water for three to four weeks until they transform into what looks more like an actual crab. And then from then on out, they live on the bottom for the rest of their life. So for that three to four weeks while they're floating around, they are transported far and wide by currents and tides and waves so that by the time they actually transform into a little crab they could be hundreds of miles away from where they hatched as an egg and then they also the, this, this species of crab can live in really warm and really cold conditions so oftentimes they'll burrow into the mud and this is a picture of sort of little burrow holes along this bank muddy bank um, and they'll do that in the summer to avoid really extreme warm temperatures, and they'll do it in the winter to avoid really extremely cold temperatures. And then um, they also have a really thick, hard shell, which helps protect them from predators or things that would like to eat them. And they're very aggressive, so that means that they can really compete with our native species for things like food and shelter and other really important resources. And then they also have a really diverse diet. And so that just means that they eat a lot of different things. So when they invade into a new area, a shortage of food is never a problem because they can pretty much eat anything. Okay, so we know that they're a really good invasive species. They're very successful at being invasive and that they are increasing in abundance with warming water. So why is that bad? What is it about them that's bad for the ecosystem? Well, the first thing is predation. Green crabs can eat a lot of our native species, and really in particular, a lot of our shellfish, so things like clams and mussels and oysters. So this is a picture of a green crab eating a soft shell clam, and they can eat a lot of them. They can eat up to 40 soft shell clams at once. So the clam really has no, um, uh, defense against the crab because it has such a thin brittle shell the crab can just crush right through it and so what we've seen as green crabs have become more abundant is that there's fewer and fewer soft shell clams because the crabs are eating so many of them so of course that's bad for our ecosystem to be losing this really important species but again it's another example where it's bad for our fishermen as well because there's a lot of fishermen who depend on this species to make a living the next reason is competition. Like I was saying, they're a very aggressive species, so they compete with our native species. So they can compete with things like baby lobsters or small um, native crabs like Jonah crabs and rock crabs. And they can compete for food and shelter and things like that that are really important for these small native organisms. And then finally, habitat destruction. So there's really two habitats that we're concerned with when it comes to green crabs. The first is eelgrass, so that's the picture on the left over here. Um, essentially, eelgrass is like an underwater meadow, right? So you can see these long sort of blades of green grass. And so this is a really important habitat for things like baby lobsters and baby flounder. And what happens with the green crabs is that they go into the eelgrass and they burrow into the mud and it actually uproots the grass and kills it. And so we've actually seen that they've wiped out a lot of these really important eelgrass beds along the coast. And then the second habitat that they have a bad impact on is salt marsh habitat. So that's the picture on the right. And essentially what happens is that they burrow into the mud and the salt marsh and that destabilizes it. That causes a lot of erosion. So basically the salt marsh starts to sort of crumble and fall away into the ocean. 
So these are some of the reasons why uh, these green crabs have had a really negative impact on the ecosystem and why we should be concerned if they're becoming more abundant. So what can we do? Well, they have been in the United States for over 200 years and we still really haven't found a successful strategy for addressing this invasive species problem. So that led myself and some of my colleagues a few years ago to start thinking outside the box. And we thought, if you can't beat them, then maybe you can eat them. Or another way to think of it is, if they're here and they're here to stay, is there some way that we could benefit from them by creating fisheries and seafood products that people want to eat? So, enter this plate of deep fried soft shell green crabs. So, this is a photo that was taken by one of our partners, Jonathan Taggart. Um, this was taken in Venice, Italy. And it turns out that there is a centuries old, hundreds and hundreds of years old fishery for green crabs in Italy. And this green crab species is called the Mediterranean green crab, which is almost identical to the European green crab, which is the crab we have here. So um, this is a, a fishery that um, supports hundreds and hundreds of fishermen. And it turns out what they're really looking for are these soft crabs that have just molted. So this is a picture of a crab that's actually shedding its old shell, a process we call molting. And it's doing that because crustaceans have to shed their old hard shell in order to grow bigger. So they start to grow a very soft new shell underneath, which is a little bit bigger than the old shell. And they shed that old shell and then they grow into the new shell. And that new shell is very, very soft. So as soon as the crab sheds its old shell, that's when the fishermen want to take that product and sell it to the restaurants because that's when it's worth the most money because the restaurants can then take the soft crabs, throw them in some batter, throw them in a deep fryer, and then put them on your dinner plate. So it turns out that this fishery in Italy is, um, is very, very what we call lucrative um, because these crabs, the fishermen can sell for as much as $55 a pound. So they make a lot of money off of selling these soft shell crabs. Just as a comparison to one of our New England fisheries, a really high price per pound for lobster would be eight or nine dollars a pound. So you can compare that to $55 a pound and get a sense of how much these fishermen are making off of these soft shell green crabs. So we thought this seems like a really great idea and is there a way that we could try to create a similar fishery here in New England? So we went about trying to create a soft shell green crab fishery first in Maine. We started this uh, about four years ago. And the first step was really to learn from the fishermen. So to learn from these Italian fishermen who'd been doing this for hundreds of years. So because of our connection with our partner, Jonathan Taggart, who lives in Maine, but works in Venice very often, we were able to create some relationships with fishermen over in Venice. And so we were able to learn from them. We were able to actually travel to Venice and work with them. We were able to host them here in New England so that we could actually work with them in our own ecosystem with our own crabs. And this was really what allowed us to very quickly learn about this fishery and create a similar fishery here in Maine and in New England. And the most important thing that we learned from these fishermen was how to identify a pre-molt green crab. So this is a crab that's just about to shed its shell and become that soft shell crab that's worth so much money. So in this picture, you can see uh, these arrows pointing to the um, outside of all of these little platelets on the underside of the crab. And what we're looking for here is a shadow region that starts to appear. That's happening because the new shell has started to grow underneath the old shell. And as they separate, that shadow appears. And so being able to identify these crabs that are just about to molt is the really biggest, most important thing in this fishery. 
So having learned this from these Venetian fishermen, the next step was to figure out if we could actually find primal crabs in our own environment back in Maine. And so in order to do this, we needed to start monitoring green crab populations. And so one of the things we did were trap surveys where we'd go out once a week and set traps, and then we would go through all of the crabs that we caught to see if we could find those pre crabs. And the other way we did this was through intertidal or shoreline surveys. So the nice thing about green crabs is that you can catch them in traps in shallow water, but you can also find them very easily just along the shoreline because they live in that intertidal zone as well. And so we were able to actually go out and uh, across both spring, summer, and um, fall and actually survey these populations of green crabs and find when and where we could, could um, detect these primal crabs in the ecosystem. And so once we did that, once we were able to actually find the primal crabs, the next step was figuring out if we could actually produce soft shell crabs from that. And so when we would find these primal crabs from our surveys, we would put them in these little individual cages that we called crab condos. And that allowed us to observe these individuals over a long period of time, so days to weeks in some cases. And when we first started doing this in 2016, we weren't all that good at it yet. We, we weren't quite um, able to be successful in recognizing what was and wasn't a pre molt crab. So not a lot of the crabs that we saved and put in these little cages actually molted and became a soft shell crab. But by 2018, we had learned a lot so that 82% of the crabs that we identified as pre molt and saved out in these cages actually did in fact molt and become a soft shell crab. So that's what that pie chart is showing there on the right hand side. So now we had figured out that we could find pre molt crabs we could hold them until they molted. We could produce the soft shell crabs that are worth so much money. So the fourth and final step was to convince people to eat them. And luckily that was not too hard. So these are some pictures of the really creative and delicious ways that chefs and restaurants we work with have come up with to serve soft shell green crab. Um, really exciting it was that in 2018 and 2019, the fishermen who had been working on the project with us produced their own soft shell crabs and they actually sold them to restaurants for $30 a pound. So a very high price, which was what we were hoping for, not quite as high as the $55 a pound that they get in Venice, but still a very high price and makes it very worthwhile for fishermen to participate. And so now, um, at this point in the project, we're really trying to get more and more people involved and more and more fishermen producing these crabs. Um, the more people that we have involved, the more fishermen who are, are harvesting green crabs, the more we're taking out of the environment. So the more invasive crabs that we're removing. So it's really a win-win situation. So this is just an example of one of the ways that we're trying to find solutions to the invasive green crab problem. But I wanna turn back now to population monitoring um, because that's really what I wanna focus on from here on out. So if you'll remember, I had said that population monitoring was really important for us because it allowed us to determine when and where we could find cream crabs in the environment. Um, in general though, population monitoring of anything could be uh, green crabs on the shoreline or crickets in your backyard or trees. Um, it, it really is important for several reasons. So it really allows scientists to understand how populations change over time and from place to place. So for instance, we survey these green crab populations from May through November. So we can see how the population changes from spring, summer, and fall. And then we do it every year so that we can start to see how the population changes from year to year. It also, um, population monitoring also allows scientists to understand how species interact with each other in their environment. 
So um, again, you'll remember that green crabs are very competitive with our native species. So we can survey areas and see what the trends are in terms of the amount of invasive versus native species that we find. Oftentimes, if we go to a site that has a high abundance of green crabs, we don't find very many native species, likely because the green crabs have outcompeted them. And then it also allows us to predict future trends. So often, again, with our green crab monitoring, we find that in very cold years, there's not as many green crabs, and in warm years, there's more green crabs. So if we can predict that the Gulf of Maine is going to continue warming, which we know it is, then we can also predict that green crabs are likely to continue to increase in abundance. And then finally, it allows us to make decisions based on our observations. So once again, with our green crab monitoring, we've really been able to make decisions about how to develop a fishery for soft shell green crab based off of what we've observed from our population monitoring. So um, the activity that we do in the classroom to um, really focus on population monitoring are these intertidal surveys. So again, green crabs can be found very easily along the shoreline. It's a very effective way to monitor green crab populations. And so often we'll do one or two classroom visits with um, a particular class, and then we will do a field trip out to the shoreline where we actually conduct a survey. And the survey that the students conduct is actually based completely and entirely off of surveys that myself or any other researcher would go out and conduct. Um, so basically, they're using a transect tape and quadra and um, calipers, clipboards, data sheets, um, fairly standard and um, uh, straightforward equipment. But before we go out onto the shoreline to do our surveys, we do a mock survey in the classroom. And this allows the students to practice actually conducting the survey, recording data, analyzing data, and then doing some um, uh, drawing some conclusions from those the data they collected and the trends that they found. And so this allows students to get a sort of a sense of the gear they're using and, and how to record data. Um, and it also, we, we talk a lot about sort of using a quadrat and why you would want to have a standardized unit of measurement when you're um, conducting these surveys and in general trying to draw conclusions about the density of a population. So um, the first year that I did this, uh, this actually is the picture of the first year I did it, which was six years ago. I actually thought it would be a clever idea if the thing we were surveying in the classroom was candy, um, but it turns out that that is not a good idea to bring a bunch of candy into a classroom and scatter it across the floor. Uh, it was pretty distracting. Um, but essentially, the, the students just need to have something that they can be surveying that sort of mimics the species that they would find on the shoreline. And so from here on out, after this one particular year, I decided to use just colored chips, kind of like poker chips. Um, and so this is the data sheet that the students use, and I'm not going to go through it in very much detail. Um, it just gives sort of an introduction and some vocabulary and then step by step the activity that they're doing. But what I want to draw more attention to is this bottom part. So this is the actual data sheet that they're going to use to fill out. And so I'll blow that up a little bit here. And so essentially, um, I've scattered these colored chips across the transect and they're gonna use their quadrat to sample those chips. And so over here, we see this first column says quadrat number, and then number one would just be the first quadrat. And so in that quadrat, they are told to count the number of red, green, blue, and white chips. So this is just an example of what they might get. It's different every time because they're just, the chips are randomly scattered. And then they flip their quadrat and they do this until they've sampled a total of four quadrats. So again, just an example of what this might look like. And then at the end, they're told to total all of the colored chips. So how many red did you find total? How many green, blue, and white? And these numbers always are the same because I've pre-counted the chips. I want them to find a certain number of each color. So they always find two red total, 24 green, four blue, and eight white. 
And then we take an average. Again, we can talk about the importance of having that standard unit of area in which you're sampling. So they divide their total number by four because that's the number of quadrats that they've sampled. And we get 0 0.5 um, red chips per quadrat, um, six green, one blue, and two white as our average numbers. So then there's a color chart here at the bottom because each color chip actually represents a different species that we would be surveying on the shoreline. So the red chips are lobsters, the green chips are green crabs, blue is Asian shore crabs, which is another invasive crab species, and then white is the Jonah crab, which is our, one of our native crab species. And so then knowing this, they can start to draw some conclusions about what they found in these surveys. So for instance, one of the questions is, which species is most abundant in the intertidal zone. So they can come up to their averages and pretty clearly see that the green chips or the green crabs were the most abundant. And then overall, did you find more invasive or, or native species? And so again, we have uh, the lobster and the Jonah crab as the two native species, and then the green crab and the Asian shore crab as invasive. So they find far more invasive than native species in the survey. So, and I should also point out that these numbers are actually based off of real survey data. So this is very similar to the trends that they will actually find when they go out into the field. So um, the next activity that they do, which is by far the favorite, especially since I stopped bringing candy into the classroom, um, we actually handle live green crabs. So this gives the students a chance to actually practice the, the characteristics that they're going to be recording in the field for every crab that they find in their quadrats. So we practice measuring, um, we measure the carapace width of the crab, which is the standard size measurement of a crab. We practice using calipers um, and how to take measurements in millimeters. We practice identifying male versus female crabs. So you can tell that from the abdomen of the crab, the male has this triangular shaped abdomen and the female has this beehive shaped abdomen. Uh, we look at female crabs with eggs, so they know what that looks like and how to record that. We talk about determining if a crab is hard shell or soft shell, um, recording injuries, if they're missing any of their claws or legs. Uh, recording color characteristics, basically everything that they're going to need to be able to do when they're out in the field. And then after these initial classroom activities, we actually go on a field trip to the shoreline and conduct the surveys. And by this point, the students are usually pros at this because they know exactly how to conduct the survey and what measurements to take. And they're generally already familiar with and fairly comfortable with handling the crabs. So we usually get a lot done. Um, we spend about two hours on the shoreline, which is the window we have with the tide. Um, and we get a lot of sampling um, uh, conducted in this timeline. And then the final thing that we do um, at the end of the surveys, we usually sort of reconvene on the shoreline and talk about trends that we found, any really interesting observations. And then they give all of their data sheets to me and I take them and do a little bit of analysis and a little bit of visualization that I then give back to the teachers to share with the class. So this is just an example of some data that the Georgetown Central School collected in 2018 and 2019. So we look at the number of quadrats sampled, how many crab, green crabs total to get a density estimate. So we had 3.2 crabs per meter squared in 2018 and 2.2 crabs per meter squared in 2019. We look at the sex ratio, so how many male versus female green crabs we found. And we can start to see some slight differences from year to year and kind of start hypothesizing about why we might be seeing some of these differences. Uh, and this is just another example of some of the data that we look at. So this figure on the left is looking at the size of the crabs that we found. Um, black bars are 2018 and purple bars are 2019. So we see a little difference where we had smaller crabs in 2018 and sort of more medium-sized crabs in 2019. And then finally, we look at the species that we were um, collecting because of course, we aren't just looking at green crabs when we do these surveys, we're looking at other species as well. And so we can kind of compare 
You see in 2019, we found 89% of the species were green crabs in our surveys, which is fairly typical. Um, but what's interesting actually in, in this case is actually the Asian shore crabs. So you see that blue chunk of the pie chart is 9% Asian shore crab. That's actually the highest we've ever found. And we've sort of seen it gradually growing in the last five or six years. So we're actually seeing the progression of this relatively new invasive species on the main coastline. So yeah, so that's sort of, that's where we end with these lessons and then we go back the next year and do it all again. Um, so at this point I'm gonna wrap up and we'll be happy to answer any questions folks might have. All right, well, Marissa, thank you so much. And we do have several questions that folks have sent in. Uh, so we'll try to get to as many as we can. The first one is, what's the role of soft shell crabs in the marine ecosystem? Um, well, so I would say in general, the, the soft shell part of the, the um, like growing cycle, essentially, it doesn't have any specific role in the ecosystem. The, the crabs are only soft for a few days after they shed their shell. Um, and so when they, the, the shell eventually hardens back up, they're just a normal hard shell crab again. Um, and this is true for lobsters and Jonah crabs, rock, any crustacean. Um, so for the green crabs, I think it's more a matter of just their role overall, whether they're hard shell or soft shell. Um, when they're in that really soft phase, they tend to hide. So they actually have less of an impact on the ecosystem when they're in that soft shell phase. They're very, very vulnerable. Pretty much anything could eat them at that point in time. So they tend to hide, they burrow, or they hide in the seaweed. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but. All right, and another question is outside the Gulf of Maine and Woods Hole. Uh, I understand that the invasive Asian shore crab has displaced the green crab to some extent along the shore, uh, driving it into deeper water. Is this happening in the Gulf of Maine too? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a, a great observation. Um, I actually did a lot of um, shoreline work around Nahant, which is just north of Boston. Um, when I did my, my PhD at Northeastern, that's where our marine lab was. And we actually had like a, a very long 20 plus year time series of data on that shoreline that very clearly showed that the shoreline went from being dominated by green crabs to dominated by Asian shore crabs. So we're seeing that in areas of northern Massachusetts. Um, we're not seeing that in Maine yet, just simply because Asian shore crabs aren't that abundant yet in Maine, but we do anticipate that that likely will happen. I should also point out though that they have displaced the green crabs, but it hasn't had an impact overall on the abundance of green crabs. They just have moved elsewhere. So, so like the, the question did point out, the green crabs are moving into deeper water because the Asian shore crabs are sort of overrunning that shoreline area. But overall, the green crabs are just as abundant or more than they ever have been. And how do you keep the condo crabs alive? <laughs> it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, so another reason why green crabs are such a great invasive species is that it's like impossible to kill them. Um, so we don't have to feed them because typically leading up to the molt cycle, Oftentimes when we, when we find a pre-molt crab, it's between two and three weeks away from molting and becoming soft. In that time period, they tend to stop feeding anyways, even in nature, um, just because everything's sort of shutting down and their body is entering into this growth phase where they're preparing to go through this very, um, you know, immense transformation where they shed their shell. Um, so you don't have to feed them. Um, we keep those the, the cages, the crab condos, inside floating lobster crates. So they're in the water, um, in ambient conditions, you know, very similar to where they would be living anyways in terms of water temperature and oxygen and all of that. Um, so it's, it's fairly simple and um, it doesn't really require anything very special apart from being able to have an area where you can float lobster crates 
Uh, where can folks try green crabs at restaurants? Do we publish a list where they can find a restaurant? And how do we convince our local restaurants to serve green crabs? So first part of that question, um, I think that's a great idea. I think we definitely could list some restaurants because now there's restaurants in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island that are serving green crab. Um, so we could definitely put together a list that we could, you know, put onto the website or, or share with folks. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, and the, the, the part of convincing them, actually, that's, that's not the challenge. It's very easy to convince restaurants to utilize green crab. The, the hard part is actually the supply. So um, particularly with the soft shell green crab. So right now we have just a handful of fishermen who are participating in producing these soft shell crabs. And whatever they produce, is really at this point just enough to supply the handful of restaurants that they work directly with. And so in order to get to a point where we have more supply, we need more and more fishermen participating. And in that situation, when we have that supply, I think that we'll be able to easily convince many, many more restaurants to, to serve soft shell green crab. And so that's sort of where our attention is turned at this point, is figuring out ways to get more fishermen involved through workshops and trainings, um, you know, providing educational material, outreach activities, so we can really bump up the, the amount of people participating in the, the supply of the actual product. Is the crab molt cycle seasonal? It is, yes. Um, so that again is what part of our population monitoring was able to discover. Um, so we find that the male crabs tend to be molting in May, June, and July, and then the females tend to be molting August, September, and October. And um, will you be working with any young people this summer since, um, since schools were out this spring? That was the plan. Um, we'd, we had some um, classroom activities and field work activities lined up for the spring, but at this point that's all on hold. Um, usually the majority of what we do happens with the schools um, happens in May and June um, towards the end of the year and then again in September and October. So we usually do sort of like a spring and a fall um, with the classroom activities. And so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do this in the fall like we typically would, but for, for now, the spring and early summer, that's all on hold. And uh, what are the schools who have this as part of their curriculum? So there's two schools that I've worked with for the past um, five or six years, like very steadily every, you know, every spring, every fall. Um, that's Georgetown Central School and West Bath Elementary School. Um, then there's several other schools that I've sort of worked with on and off intermediately, depending on what their availability is. Um, I, I have to say that this is very much a group effort and, and you know, it's not all me. Um, it has to also depend a lot on a teacher who is very motivated and very willing to make this happen. Um, and so, and, you know, so thank you to the teachers who have been able to, to help with this work and providing us the platform to be able to do this. Um, two years ago, we actually started working with um, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute Vital Signs Program. And so they actually found a way to adapt this work and these surveys to actually um, be encompassed in their vital signs program so that actually now this is reaching, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, but I would say dozens probably of schools on the coast of Maine through that vital signs program. And so it's really interesting because um, with that platform, the teachers and the students go out and conduct the survey that is designed off of, off of this protocol that we're using. And then they upload their data to an online website. And then that data is um, reviewed by one of three scientists, um, myself and, and two others. And then um, we actually can utilize that data for our own research, for education. Um, so it's, that's been really great and it's really expanded our, our reach with this work. 
Uh, how much are the parents involved with the, the lesson and do they catch their kids' enthusiasm? Um, so the parents usually are involved as chaperones on the field trips. Um, and, and so there's definitely a lot of um, interest and involvement from the parents when we're out on the shoreline. Um, other than that, I mean, there's not a lot of like, you know, activities that would be done at home or, or anything like that. Everything really is focused on the classroom until we go out into the field. So, um, so yeah, so the parents are great as chaperones and actually most of the classes that I've worked with for quite some time now, it's um, not an issue of not getting enough chaperones. It's an issue of having too many parent chaperones because everyone wants to chaperone this field trip. <laughs> um, so that's really great to see that level of excitement and involvement. Awesome. And uh, when you talk about establishing a fishery for green crabs, what exactly does that entail? Uh, and is there an established infrastructure for marketing the green crab? Um, no. So yeah, with the infrastructure, that's definitely been one of our hurdles for sure. Um, so I guess there's a couple of different sort of components to this. So um, the, the fishery itself, the way it operates, is very similar to the lobster fishery. So you go out and you set a trap to catch crabs, you, you know, a baited trap, and you go back and you haul it a day or several days later. Um, so that's very, very similar to the lobster fishery. Um, so, so, you know, not new in terms of gear or, or technique or anything like that. So that's been great because that's been a really easy thing to adapt for fishermen. Um, the, the process of holding crabs until they molt is a little bit different um, because you know, that, that takes up a little bit of space and it requires that you have access to a dock or a mooring or something like that. But it's still, it's not um, so different that it's, it's not manageable. Um, again, very similar gear, lobster crates, things like that. Um, and a lot of it is gear that people already have on hand. So I think a fairly low barrier to entry in terms of that. Um, the, one of the biggest hurdles is that there's not really much for infrastructure once we get past that stage. So in terms of processing, um, I would say that's processing is kind of an issue with a lot of fisheries in Maine and New England in general. Um, but yeah, we've, we've run into a little bit of a, a hurdle in terms of expanding this fishery and growing it. Um, I think the next step is really thinking about what that sort of processing infrastructure would look like and how we would actually move forward in terms of growing the industry. But we've had a couple of questions about uh, predators for green crabs. Do they have any natural predators? Do seals eat them? Do lobsters compete with them? Yeah, um, so that's, that's a great question. And I would say that they, the green crab has a lot of predators. Um, you know, the seals, birds, I've seen raccoons on the shoreline eating them, fish, um, striped bass love to eat green crabs. Um, lobsters will, if it's a large enough lobster. Um, so I don't think that it's a lack of predators that has allowed the green crab to really increase so much in abundance. I do think that they, they do have natural predators in this environment. Um, I think that a lot of it is, is just their ability to reproduce so many eggs that spread far and wide. And they, they, they're also, um, their adaptability, I guess you would call it. Um, essentially, they can live in incredibly harsh environments. They can live underwater, they can live on the shoreline, they can be out of the water for days, sometimes months at a time. They can absorb oxygen across their gills so that they don't have to, from the air, so that they don't have to be in the water in order to breathe. Um, they can even absorb nutrients across their gills so that theoretically they could just hide in a hole and not even have to go out and forage for food because they can absorb food and nutrients directly across their gills. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible and they can live in extreme heat and extreme cold. And so I would say it's that sort of tolerance of so many 
environmental conditions that allows them to really be such an amazing invasive species. Marissa, do you return to the same tidal areas each year to give consistency to the numbers that you collect? Yes, yep, so we do with, um, with the school groups, absolutely. Um, we go to the same sites and, and focus on the same areas. Um, and I also, with my own research outside of what we do with the school groups, I do monthly intertidal surveys of, at this point, I think five or six different sites in Midcoast, Maine, and we go to the same site every month from May through November every year. And uh, are the crabs using holes, existing holes in marsh, or are they making them? Uh, they, yeah, the, the, they, the crab seems to bore vertically, not horizontally. The, yeah, they make holes in the marsh. Um, and yeah, a, a vertical versus horizontal. Um, I, from what I see, they typically are going in from the mud flats into the sides of the marshes, so kind of more horizontal. That's not to say that they couldn't bore holes down in vertically. Um, but yeah, it's, it's typically they're digging out a hole, although you will see that they'll dig out a, a hole kind of like a, it's sort of like a shelter essentially, and the same crab will return back to that same hole again and again. Um, but it's really a matter of there being you know, at one site, hundreds and hundreds of crabs all doing that. And so you start to see the marsh erode. Uh, are there any native species that might be decimated by the Asian shore crabs? That's a great question. Um, it's hard to say. So the, the Asian shore crab, it's not necessarily a predator that's going to wipe out, you know, our populations of our shellfish or, or things like that. Um, I think the bigger problem with the Asian shore crabs is that they become so abundant in an area that they drive everything else out. So in places in um, northern Massachusetts where we used to survey, you could flip, you know, a, a rock that was about this size over and there would be 20 or 30 Asian shore crabs underneath of that one rock. Um, so they just get to the point where they're so abundant that nothing else can live in that area. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it's predation, but it's definitely uh, an issue with space and, and competition. Uh, how many times per year do green crabs molt and how often do females lay eggs? Yeah, so it changes throughout their life cycle. So when they hatch from an egg, they go through um, sort of a, a four to five stage process in the larval phase, and then they metamorphose into what looks more like a crab. And then at that point in their first year of life, they can molt up to 12 times. Um, and then after that first year of life, it slows down. So then they would be molting, you know, three times a year, two times a year, once a year, once every other year. And they live uh, at most about seven years, but that's probably on the high end. Um, so it's, it slows down progressively. Um, the females, it, they, they can reproduce at least once a year, but there's evidence that it could be more than that. It could be twice a year. And have you been able to prove that green crabs will be a viable choice for fishermen? So once we actually got that price point of $30 a pound, that really changed a lot because then we were actually able to look at the cost benefit analysis. So how much does it cost for the gear, for you know, the, the fuel and the bait that it takes to catch the crabs? How much time is it taking for you to actually spend you know, checking your crabs until they become soft? Um, and so we were able to really look at a lot of that information. And yes, I mean, from, from what we can tell, at least thus far, I mean, we still have some, you know, continued work to be doing, but it, it is viable. At $30 a pound, it is definitely viable. So we had um, two fishermen in 2018, I believe it was, who were on just a very, very small scale producing crabs, and they were producing about 100 crabs a week, and this was just in their spare time. Um, one, one of these, uh, well, both were fishermen. One was a lobsterman and one was a clam digger. And in their spare time, they would spend, you know, an hour or two at most a day 
on this green crab fishery. And they would produce about 100 soft shell crabs a week and then sell them for $3 a piece. So they were making about $300 a week extra just doing it on a very small scale. So we absolutely think that if you can scale, even at that scale as a side business, it's, it's viable. But if you could scale that up, then it would very much be viable as a sole you know, business of just being a green crab, soft shell green crab fisherman. We've just got a couple of final questions. Uh, are the Asian shore crabs also edible or marketable? Yes. Uh, so I, <laughs> it, it's hard to say. So they're very small. Um, that's one of the issues. They get to be about the size of a quarter, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so they're a very, very small crab. Um, I did go to a restaurant in New Haven, Connecticut called Mia's and they were serving Asian shore crab and I had it. It was delicious, but it was, um, basically served the whole crab it was you know about the size of a quarter and it was hard shell so it's very crunchy um that's the only place i've ever seen that actually had asian shore crab on the menu i don't know of anyone who is working towards making that a viable fishery um it certainly could be there's no reason why you can't eat them um, but I think probably the biggest impediment is just that it's such a small crab compared to what we would normally, I mean, even green crabs are small, but they get much bigger than an Asian shore crab. But compared to like a Dungeness crab or a stone crab or a Jonah crab, which is what we're really used to when we think of crab in this country, um, I think that might be one of the biggest challenges with the Asian shore crab. And besides waiting for the window of opportunity when the shells on green crabs are soft, is there a way to condition them to make them a food source when they're hard shelled, maybe by boiling or steaming? That's a great, great question. So again, with the green crabs, part of the problem is their size. So they are too small for a viable picked meat market. Um, we've tried every way that you could possibly extract meat from them and it's just not efficient or effective, even high pressure um, processing, which uses water. Um, so for a picked meat market, no, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other products. And so we are working with some folks at the University of Maine who are trying to develop a fermented crab sauce, very similar to a fish sauce which essentially would just use crushed up green crab and salt fermented to make a sauce. Um, we're also working with some folks who are looking at um, making stock. I mean, just crab and water and some other flavorings you boil down and create stocks that can be used for, you know, soups and chowders and things like that. Um, we're also working with some folks who are trying to create a liquid fertilizer for your garden. Um, and then finally, we're working with some folks who are really focused on the bait market, which there already is actually a market for green crabs used as bait in the whelk fishery and in some hook and line fisheries as well. Um, but we're specifically looking at the, the potential for green crabs to be used as lobster bait. And for our final... Products. <laughs> Uh, for our last question, uh, what is the role of soft shell clams in the marine ecosystem? So soft shell clams are um, a filter feeding species. So they filter water and extract food from the water. And so by doing that, they also are promoting water quality. So they really do, um, you know, an immense job of cleaning water, essentially. Um, they're uh, a, a, a potential prey species for, for other native predators, things like um, black sea bass actually will eat soft shell clams and some other fish species. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, they're essentially, they've been part of our ecosystem for, um, you know, since its existence. And so having them as part of that ecosystem is really important in terms of having a balanced um, uh, ecosystem and uh, and promoting that water quality um, and also uh, as part of the social ecosystem as well because they are a very important part of fisheries in New England and there's a lot of people who depend on harvesting soft shell clams to make a living 
Well, Marissa, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your insight and your knowledge with us. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for participating uh, in this special uh, web webinar. Um, I know that many of you are longtime members and longtime supporters of Manimet. And so I just want to say thank you. I want you to know how grateful we are for your generosity and your commitment to us, for our work. Uh, if you're not a current Manimet member, I hope you will consider making a gift to support our work and part of our effort to build a more sustainable world uh, as a nonprofit. Individual donors are really the ones that make our work possible. Uh, whether it's restoring, uh, restoring shorebird habitat, preparing forests for climate change, uh, creating resilient fisheries like Rissa is doing, uh, and so much more. So you can make a secure online donation at manamit.org slash donate, or you can text manamit to 44321. So once again, thank you so much for visiting with us today virtually. Uh, Marissa, thank you again so much for this presentation, this really terrific presentation. And uh, we hope to see everyone again on a future webinar. You can see all of our upcoming webinars and events at manamit.org slash events. Thanks again, everyone.